You're listening to Tech Forward. I'm your host, Cheryl Chotrani. I'm a tech founder, developer, investor, and an industry enthusiast. And I believe that diversity can transform businesses and improve the world we live in. The Tech Forward podcast is a place for tech entrepreneurs, executives, venture capitalists, and diversity champions to share their stories, insights, and visions of the future. Together, we'll discuss the path to improving representation for women, minorities, and other underrepresented groups. What challenges, strategies, and possible solutions will shape the road ahead? Let's find out together. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Tech Forward. Today on the show, we have Nesh Pillay, founder of Press Pillay, a digital communications agency on a social mission. She is a former journalist who covered international advertising and marketing as a founding reporter of the Drums New York team. She later joined Toronto-based ad tech company EQ Works as their VP of marketing, where she made her foray into the tech field. Nesh will be sharing with us the lessons she's learned working with tech startups through her agency and her experience coming back to the workforce after becoming a mom. It's going to be a great discussion, so let's dive right in. Hi, Nesh. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. So it'd be wonderful to start by just having you share with our listeners a little bit about your background and how you made your way into public relations and working with tech startups. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I actually started off my career as a journalist. You could call me a traditionalist in that I wanted to do very traditional journalism. You know, I wasn't into the direction that journalism was taking, but I quickly realized that um, if I wanted to do that, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> and so I had to start adopting newer technologies in my reporting. It's, it's, it's kind of a common thing, actually, to make the switch from journalism over to public relations over the years. That's sort of the trajectory my career took. But through that, I ended up doing uh, a lot of work with advertising technology to start. And through that, I've gotten a really good grasp and a real appreciation for tech startups and uh, sort of the work that goes into it and really how, how these startups are changing the ecosystem of everything we do. So now you've launched a new agency called Press Play. Amazing name. I love it. So how did your agency get started? You know, I was working on my normal full-time job, but people kept coming to me on the side to be like, hey, can you do some PR? And I realized then that it was something I loved and something I was really good at. So initially, I was just sort of taking clients. And this started when I was in New York, and it happened uh, in Toronto as well. It wasn't until after I had my daughter that I kind of was like, you know what, do I really want to get up and go to a job every day that I don't really love? Or do I want to take hold of this and create an agency? Being a reporter and then also being on the other side, I, I, I noticed a lot of the holes in the industry um, in ways that uh, the industry is not really adapting to new technologies, which leaves especially a lot of startups feeling, I guess, ignored in that, you know, just sending out a press release is not good PR anymore. And a lot of agencies don't quite understand that yet. So I was able to come in at a really good time and, and adapt newer technology, which tech brands tend to love. So talk about some of the services you provide and how you decided to focus on lifestyle tech. Yeah, we kind of stick to creating content, both for social, written content, uh, video content. And then our, our main thing, our bread and butter is PR. But we kind of take an interesting approach to that where I, I say we take an experiential or advertising approach to public relations. So instead of just sending out an announcement, which, you know, again, there's there's room for press releases, especially for SEO purposes and things like that. But we, we help our brands actually be newsworthy and create news. And that's a really fun, creative process for us. Lifestyle tech was sort of a natural progression for us. And, you know, it, it sounds kind of open ended, but I think if lifestyle brands don't have a tech component to them, they're really going to struggle now. And uh, if a tech brand doesn't have a lifestyle component to it, as in, you know, all brands now need to take on a personality of their own, then, then that brand's going to struggle. So we really try to bring those two worlds together that are seemingly opposite. The other thing that we do is we have a socially innovative approach to everything that we do. So a lot of our brands end up doing campaigns or end up somehow helping the world be better through either equality, empathy, or sustainability. 
So you shared in a moving blog post last year about your experience with postpartum depression and how that affected your experience returning back to work after your maternity leave. And, you know, I think that's such an important topic because a lot of women experience that. We don't talk about it a lot, but it's so prevalent in society. So I'd love for you to share your story with that and and what your experience was trying to return to the workforce after your maternity leave. For sure. When I got pregnant, before this, I had, I'm a planner. So I always sort of knew like in the foreseeable future, I I will have a child. So when I had been applying to jobs, I, I asked, hey, what's your maternity leave policy? And a lot of the time, especially with younger tech startups, I got blank stares uh, because the tech ecosystem is so young that people don't even think about it. Eventually, I ended up at a role that I really liked, the head of marketing, but I was one of two women on the entire team. So of course, no one had really been thinking about maternity leave there either. So when I did get pregnant, I was very ashamed. I didn't really tell anybody. I jokingly called it my prom night dumpster baby. (laughs) Even though I was married and old enough to have a kid, it was just this feeling like, oh my goodness, I'm doing something wrong and I'm scared to tell my boss and I'm scared to tell my colleagues. So I actually hid it till I was about seven months along. Yeah. And at the end of my pregnancy, I got really sick, which resulted in a traumatic birth experience, which then resulted in a little bit of PTSD and quite severe postpartum depression. And that was that was very tough for me because when I had the baby, I, I definitely had this feeling of, okay, you know, now I got to get back to work. So in spite of the fact that I was sick, I was afraid that basically being human, having a child would basically ruin my career. When I found out I was pregnant, the first thing I did was cry and say my career is over. And this, this perspective is ridiculous, I think. So I was, you know, up until my daughter was born, I was sending emails from my hospital bed. And a few weeks later, I think I have pictures somewhere I had Uh, put this little premature baby in a sling and had gone to the office. And um, I returned from my maternity leave in just a couple of months. I was certainly not ready physically, emotionally, and my baby wasn't ready for me to be apart from her either. But again, I felt this pressure, like I need to prove to all the men around me that I'm not just another mom or just because I'm a mom doesn't mean I'm not good at my job. And all these other you know, antiquated beliefs that I had held, I got, I went back to work. And honestly, I just I wasn't there emotionally. I mean, I think I would just sort of stare at my computer screen. I was, I was not ready. And eventually, my doctor pulled the trigger and said, you're not ready to work, you need to go back on maternity leave. Uh, so I did. Before doing so, I had other obstacles in the workplace, like I didn't have a place to pump. And so I asked uh, my employer, my HR department, they said, oh, ask building management and building management said, oh, ask your employer. And then uh, someone recommended I pump in the bathroom, which is disgusting. And then eventually uh, my boss said he would give up his office for me to use. But I mean, it very much was still at the discretion of his schedule, you know, when he's able to leave the office, then I would go in and pump. But if he's not able to leave at that time, then it gets really painful. (laughs) I don't, I don't know if you've ever had to do that. But you know, so it's just like all these little obstacles. And my days were just sort of a lot tougher. and And I wasn't ready. I think the biggest thing, and I've taken this away, and now I'm I'm very aware of this with my team is so the first thing is, I realized after I had my daughter, I was way more motivated than I ever had been before. I could do in, you know, three hours the work it would have normally taken me two days to do. Mothers are superheroes in that way. And yes, I'm calling myself a superhero. It's fine. I totally agree. I'm, I feel the same way. I'm a mom too. Oh. And I actually had a preemie as well myself. So I completely relate entirely to your experience. And you're almost telling my story, you know, as you're talking. So having to go back to work as well. Yes, I did. And I went back to work three weeks after my son was born. He was still in the hospital dealing with his premature birth. And I just, it was the same thing. You know, I felt like I had to prove myself. I felt like I had to show that I was dedicated, but it was, it was really tough emotionally because I'm obviously worrying about my son at the same time. I'm trying to focus on work and overperform. And it was just a, a constant struggle. Oh, absolutely. And especially with preemies, I think we have to like make them make weight, right? But here's the thing about equality in the workplace. We say we want equality between women and men, but real equality would be if women were treated the way men would be treated if they were pregnant. And I think, I think that's a good way to look at it, you know? So like we can't compare ourselves directly to men at, in the workplace as they are because men in the workplace as they are don't have to have the physical um, and emotional 
toll and, and stress that is bearing a child and it's beautiful and it's lovely, but it's, it's not easy on your body. And I think we need to acknowledge that and just say, you know what? It's okay. Like, it's fine. And my therapist after it kind of said to me, you know, cause I was like, I have to give a hundred percent to work and I have to give a hundred percent to baby. And I kept using this language um, in my head, everything was a win or a fail. So I'm failing my baby. I'm failing my job. And my therapist says, you don't have 200% to give. You have a hundred percent to give like that's it. And that's not wrong. You know, that doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It's perfectly normal and natural to have a child. You know, a lot of people do it. I think especially in, in regards to tech, because it's much younger, it's important to keep those things in mind because even the young people are eventually going to have babies. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, you know, yeah. And for, for working mothers, just if you're in an environment where you don't feel comfortable just existing as a working mother, then maybe that's not the right environment for you. Yeah. And the fact that you had to wait until seven months pregnant to feel comfortable even sharing that definitely was very telling. You know, I don't want to reflect poorly on my former employer or anything because my CEO was lovely. The team was lovely. But in spite of all of that, I still felt quite alone in, in, in my experience. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of your work with clients and to the extent that you maybe had worked with them on publicity relating to diversity. I know in the tech world right now, obviously diversity is getting a lot of buzz and it's something that tech companies are talking about a lot and have claimed that they're trying to improve across the board in their companies. So would love to hear about maybe some of your experience working with clients and if any of them had sought advice about publicizing around their diversity efforts, how would you as a PR professional advise tech companies or tech startups to talk about diversity through their publicity efforts in a way that comes off as authentic and not a gimmick? Yeah, absolutely. So to start with, so so there's two hats I put on. As, as a PR professional, you shouldn't get a handshake for having a diverse team at this point in time. It just is really bad PR if you don't. I mean, you seem like yeah. kind of a jerk. As a human and as, a, as, as an entrepreneur, I tend to tell my clients, like, listen, it will result in much better numbers for you at the end. And it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to see that, right? Because the, the piece of feedback I get all the time is like, you know, it's the colorblind argument. So I don't see uh, skin color or sex. Like, I just hire whoever's best. And it's okay, fine. But there is so much value in hiring a diverse set of people with different experiences and come who come from different places and actually from a PR perspective again it can avoid a lot of PR nightmares and headaches I mean there was the Starbucks issue you know recently where Starbucks gave their employees diversity training but that could have been avoided with a more diverse Mm -hmm. um, the same thing for you see certain commercials. Um, I don't know if you remember the Pepsi one from a couple years ago where Kendall Jenner walks through a crowd of Black Lives Matter protests. Oh, yeah. And hands them a can or a bottle of Pepsi and, you know, ends the, the protests by handing over a Pepsi. And, and you watch that and you think, are you so just blind to what's happening in this world? But all of that, that just says that the team that came up with that was not diverse enough or or people who were diverse weren't comfortable speaking up. It means that the team on, at Pepsi wasn't diverse enough. And it's just, it's these huge, huge, huge PR no-nos. Like they've wasted, you know, millions of dollars on that campaign that made them look really, really bad. And I think that if you look at it that way, if you can't find it within yourself to actually see the value in adding diversity to your team, and if you think just clearly dollars and cents, think about it that way. It'll, it'll really help avoid some major screw ups. And I can tell you from my experience, you know, I try to bring diversity to my team as well. My team diversity means we just, you know, had a white guy on the team. Like that's diversity for us because he brings a perspective that I'm not familiar with. And I think that if we're going to create well-rounded campaigns, if, for example, the target audience is a middle income American white family, then I need to consult middle income white Americans, you know? And so it's important to kind of understand that. Absolutely. So PR, you talk about having diverse teams as being important and, and public relations can help with that effort as well, right? With recruiting and, and kind of presenting an image of a company and, and helping to attract talent. So what are some of the ways that you might advise tech startups to use publicity to help them attract a more diverse team and, and to support their recruiting efforts? 
Absolutely. There are so many ways that this can be done. I highly recommend. So the first thing, and we already talked about it, is if you create an environment that's like inclusive of women to start with. So where a woman wouldn't be afraid to be pregnant or to have to take Mm -hmm. a couple days off on her period or, or whatever it is like that sort of team is one that you want to have. Like, I don't want to work in a place where if I need to carry a tampon to the bathroom, I have to hide it in my sleeve. That's just not, you know, that's so archaic to me. For people of of color, I think it's important to maybe have sort of like a hiring initiative where you hire from places that you wouldn't normally hire from. Or maybe you have a mentoring initiative where you mentor people from certain communities or with certain income levels, but that kind of levels the playing field a little bit. And and, and then you'll find that like, you know, not everyone who graduated with a four-year degree from a liberal arts school is going to be the best fit for your company. I think you can both attract a wider set of people, but also I think you'll do a lot better. So you mentioned that having a diverse team kind of prevents companies or at least helps alleviate some of the backlash they might get through PR from others who might look at them and say, well, you know, you're not diverse or criticize them for their lack of effort. So what are some of the ways that people are using PR to hold companies accountable? How can employees or or kind of the general public mobilize the press to help ensure that companies not only say that they're going to act on diversity, but actually proceed with action. Absolutely. So I, I, I will start by saying I think that companies that don't have a very diverse team, I don't necessarily think that they should be demonized right off the bat. Uh, I think the problem comes in when there's no effort to do so. I used the Starbucks example before because that's a newer one and a relevant one. That's an example of how just a, a bystander taking a video resulted in a lot of pressure on Starbucks. I do think that, you know, shutting down the store for diversity training, it almost felt a little kitschy, a little too little late, and not a lot of people bought it. Uh, myself included. But but those are the sort of efforts that can really result in, in a company changing what they're doing, whether it's being done for their own purposes, you know, to cover their butts, or whether it's being done just to sort of be a better brand. Not only that, but I don't think we should be afraid to call each other out. Because personally, a little bit ago, I had put up an ad for an intern, and I didn't mention that the position was paid because I just assumed it was a, it was implied. And I got a bit of Twitter backlash uh, from someone claiming that I was I was offering an unpaid internship. Now I wasn't, and this actually was someone who wanted to apply for the job, and he didn't get it. But I think you know what? Like I kind of appreciated someone calling me out. I think I think that you need to be able to do that. With the age of social media right now, it's easier than ever to reach out to brands. If you're on an airline, for example, and you know there's a lack of diversity, or you notice that uh, there's a conversation going on that's just blind or deaf, call the airline out. You know we have almost with, through social media, we have direct access to brands, and our voices are heard. Brands are af- afraid of that. You know, I don't know if you've ever tweeted negatively about a brand, but you get a response almost right away. Um, I once found an arrow that didn't have any bubbles in it. And I was very upset, (laughs) you know, and so and so I think it's just really important to hold brands accountable. Because like I mentioned earlier, brands are no longer these stoic sort of unattainable things that they once were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Right now, brands take on personalities like people do. And that means taking on a value set. And you want to make sure, and consumers really want to make sure that the brands they're associating with sort of share similar values. And it's the same kind of thing with with Nike right now. People are, you know, taking a stance either way. People are burning their Nikes or, you know, wearing Nike to show support. And I think brands shouldn't be afraid of that either. Um, Sometimes brands don't take a stand because they're afraid of alienating part of the audience. I always recommend against that. I say take a stand because even if you do alienate a a small subset of your audience, the audience that sticks around will really, really stick around and will really support you. So as companies are starting to think about diversity and understand that the value that you mentioned of bringing in diverse perspectives, being able to avoid maybe some of the negative consequences that might come with not having diversity in their teams, how can companies go about as they're building up these processes, how can they go about building that understanding of the audiences and really reaching out to their diverse base of customers if they don't already have diversity on their team? Like what are the kind of first steps they should be taking? 
I think if you're reaching out to diverse customers, you need to have a diverse team. I think that's sort of like a no brainer because Mm -hmm. again, consumers want to see themselves in the brands they're working with and in the tech that they're working with. And if they don't, then they, they similar, they just won't be on board quite in the same way. Social is such an easy, amazing way to do that. Um, And it could be little things too. It could be acknowledging Diwali, you know, or Eid. It could be actually attending festivals. I mean, in in, in some cases, I think that if your team's completely not diverse and you're doing these things, it can almost be offensive and it's just such a PR stunt, you know? And then at that point, you really have to be strategic about it. And just even if you're just doing it for the PR, just don't be a jerk about it. Sometimes when people are being really strategic, they forget about the humanness and that's when you see some of these really ridiculous efforts and again you can avoid a a faux pas by having someone on your team who's diverse or having a a lot of diversity in your team not just one person Mm -hmm. again from a PR perspective I think it's just kind of like making sure that your technology does cater to a diverse population as well Um, I understand that's the kind of against what I said about finding your audience in some ways Yes, you need to find your audience, but your audience is not always going to be middle income white men, right? Like that's just not realistic. And so how can you cater to a wider range of people? Um, Because also, I think at one point brands did focus primarily on white people because white people earned more, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. You know, we, a lot of us have disposable income to spend and we want to spend it on brands that represent us. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your insights. This has been really interesting. And I appreciate you sharing your expertise and and your story with us today. So what is the best way for our listeners to connect with you and to learn more about Press Play? Absolutely. Um, The easiest way is to hop on the Press Play website, which is Press, P-R-E-S-S, and then Play, which is my surname, P-I-L-L-A-Y.com. Little pun for you guys. Um, You can tweet at me at Play Nesh, N-E-S-H, or um, follow me on Instagram at nplay1. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's really been incredible having you on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and have a good one. For all of you out there listening, thank you so much for joining me this week. You can find the links to everything we talked about today in my show notes at goodbyeventures.com. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please reach out to me on Twitter at techforwardpod or on Instagram at techforwardpodcast. Remember, you can also connect with me by signing up for my newsletter at goodbyteventures.com slash tech dash forward dash podcast. That's bite with a Y. If you enjoy the Tech Forward podcast, please share a link with your friends over on the social media channels where you're most active. Also, please do consider writing a review of the show on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to the show. Reviews and social shares are one of the best ways for new listeners to find us. Thank you again for listening. See you next week.